three, two. Welcome to Symbol Talks. This is an episode of our Coffee Chat podcast series. We sit down with people who work with technology and talk about career, technology, fun, and really any tangential subject that comes up. We have a few simple rules. The only religion we discuss is college teams we root for. The only politics we discuss are whether we support SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL, or whether the database is just a detail. On today's show, we have Kevin Fiesel. Kevin is a Microsoft Data Platform MVP who specializes in T-SQL and R development, fighting with Kafka, and according to his data camp bio, pulling rabbits out of hats on demand. I really want to hear more about that one. I've known Kevin for years, both as a fellow MVP up until this June for me. Kevin is still an MVP for nine years running. I think my the biggest way I know Kevin is from curatedsql.com. It's one of the places we gather details for the database weekly newsletter at SQL Server Central. And reading his commentary on so many posts is always insightful. He is also the president of the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group, which you can find at meetup.com slash tripass, T-R-I-P-A-S-S, and author of the books Polybase Revealed and Finding Ghosts in Your Data, Anomaly Detection Techniques with Examples in Python. I love a good, good title that's fun to read. Mine are ridiculously long. Now, if I keep talking about Kevin's experience and qualifications, we'll probably run out of time. Then we won't be able to do an interview and that'll be a bummer. So now I'm going to bring Kevin in. Hopefully he agrees with all the great things he's done. I can neither confirm nor deny that I've done any of these things. Uh, my lawyer, on the advice of my lawyer. Oh man, let's not bring the lawyers into it. <laughs> we'll have, I'd like to have one just sitting back here going, nope, can't say that. No, you shouldn't have said that. So anything else you want to say about what you do or say or yeah, um, anything before no, we get started? At at this point, a lot of what I do these days is data science, uh, working in Python, even though I still prefer R. If, if that's a religious debate, that is one I'm willing to get into. Functional programming defeats all other sorts of programming, but I think I'll save that for another day. Yes, those are the kind of arguments I'm fully happy to have. We can entertain some people and educate them. That's the, the goal here. Okay, so let's get started. I have four questions I generally ask people. The first is a little bit about your origin story. So everyone in this industry has an origin story. Most of our origin stories don't start like this. When I was a kid, I wanted to be in data and then someday be on a podcast talking about nerdy stuff. If you're like me, you wanted to be the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys after finishing up at the Naval Academy, serving as a fighter pilot for a few years and shooting down the Red Baron on top of your doghouse. I was a complicated child, I'll admit that. And none of that ever worked out, bad eyes, overweight. There's so many things that kept me from being these things. So if you don't mind me asking, and since you were given questions ahead of time, how did you get started? So I kind of did always have a draw toward data, even, even as a young tyke. I never wanted to be a Cowboys uh, quarterback because I, I didn't like the team. I grew up during Buffalo's four Super Bowl runs. So actually the very first game I ever watched was the first Super Bowl against the Giants, wide right. I liked Buffalo's uniforms better. I was very young. I think I made the right choice in terms of uniform. I may or may not have right, made the right choice in terms of team, but I'm stuck. Nonetheless, I would say I've had a draw toward software development, computer science. That was what I went to school for. And also in economics, I've, I've been a data person uh, most of my life, which Economics led me to grad school where I got a master's degree in economics. And that master's thesis also tied in with one of my other interests, which was artificial intelligence. So kind of finding ways to link these sundry threads together in such a way that somebody's willing to pay me money to do a, what I would do for free otherwise. But please don't tell my employers. Ah, yes, that's very true. Never, never let that, never let on you would do this for free. So you were this kid, you were 10 years old, say. And somebody asked you what you wanted to do for a living and data was, was something you were interested in. How did, how did that come about? What, what, what was the spark or do you know the spark? Just... I kind of know the spark and um, there are a couple of them. You know, one of, one of these is it really, a lot of it was more software development than data necessarily. But even when I was that young, I real, I realized that a lot of the games that I would play, I refer to them today as spreadsheet games. The type of video game where what you're really doing is you've got this big spreadsheet. I need to min-max all these choices. I need to I need to select these options in here and 
then if I'm able to do that, I can grind out this many more gold coins and get get this slightly better result. And realizing, actually with a couple of the games, I literally did have a spreadsheet that I would build where I would try to fill out, here, here are all the actions that I need to take at this point in the game so that I can get the best outcome. Um, just understanding that that was a um, disturbingly large percentage of my personality kind of drove me toward, well, you know, let's find something working in data. And uh, that started out as, again, computer science, software development with some focus on data driven applications. Uh, that was a hot term right around the time that I was getting into the industry. So made it kind of easy for me to get in there. And then when I was in the industry, that's when I started learning a little bit about SQL Server because I originally was a software developer doing web applications. And there technically were a couple of people where I worked who had the job title essentially of database administrator, but didn't do much I database like administration. One of them worked mostly in SAS and the other one worked mostly in Spider Solitaire. And so <laughs> nice. I liked the I like Spider Solitaire guy. He was he was very good, uh, very good people, but you could tell he was close to retirement age uh, and close to <laughs> retirement mentality. So essentially we needed somebody to pick up these tasks of, well, how do you manage a SQL Server instance? How many SQL Server instances do we have? What are they doing? What do our prod and development environments look like? When's the last time we took a backup of this database? And when you start asking those questions, you get disturbing answers like, what is it? What's a backup? Uh, how, how would we know if we took a backup? That's when it comes time for someone to step in. And uh, that was, you know, normally in a lot of cases, you, you'll hear the story that, oh, well, I became a database administrator because I was the one who forgot to step back when everybody else did when someone asked for volunteers to fix a database problem. And in my case, it was more of, well, yeah, I'm doing this web development. I kind of like it, but you know, I also like this database stuff and wanted to learn more about it. So kind of jumped in. Yeah, I'm that person who was 100% glad he didn't step back when everybody else did. So yeah, turned out, turns out, right? And the spider solitaire person, whom I hope doesn't listen to this podcast and come after he, you. Because he retired at <laughs> least a decade, well, at this point, almost two decades, or 15 years ago. Um, retired about 15 years ago. He's probably out on his farm now, um, enjoying life. So nonetheless, if he, know, he knows who he is, if he ever reaches out, I would still, I would still play Euchre with him. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny. I, I never thought anybody would say, this is kind of the, the thing I wanted to go into. And they can, you knew it and you had a good, good excuse for it. That was, that was an excellent story. I think that's what I, I find the most fun about this is asking these questions and thinking you're going to say this, and then somebody just gives me something completely different. And that's, that's the fun, right? Yeah. All right. So the next section I want to ask, what do you love? So now that you are in technology and you've been there for quite a while, what makes you excited to get up in the morning or stay up late? Not only spending those 40 hours a week that you're, you have to I think, I don't know if you have a, per, if you're a consultant or a, a full-time employee, but, um, you spend at least probably 40 hours plus working on this technology. And then you also, as we will, we will discuss or have discussed already some, you spend countless hours talking and writing about this stuff as well. Is it all the big, great royalty checks that are coming in every week from the books you've written? Or is there, <laughs> what, what is it, what technology gets you all excited? I Speaking of royalty checks, I have actually received royalty checks before of literally dozens of dollars. So every yes, quarter, I, I can almost buy myself lunch. Um, I, I'm exactly right there. That's why I made the joke. I know that. Yep. Oh, yeah. So, oh, um, yeah. For anybody who is in the audience that has not written a technical book, you don't write technical books for the money. Maybe 25 years nope. ago you could, but not today. You write it because it's fun. It's enjoyable. Maybe it's something that you love. Maybe you got talked into it by an editor who's really good at talking you into writing books. But one of the questions, what is it that I that gets me up in the morning or keeps me up a little bit later at night than my wife wants me to be. A lot of this will come down to actually a lot of, ultimately it's, I like solving problems. I enjoy that feeling of I've accomplished a task. I, I have 
solved this issue. There's something that was previously either not possible or very difficult, and let me let me get it done. Let me find a way. And I'll naturally gravitate toward a uh, few areas. I've already made a little joke about functional programming. That is absolutely an academic interest of mine and something that I have greatly enjoyed in terms of a little bit of development work where I've actually been able to get languages like F-sharp or R uh, through the gates. And also just messing out, messing around with things in personal life, just understanding, you know, trying to learn a bit more about the ideas of computer science. I think that that's an area where I kind of wish I had the time and ability to go try to get something like a PhD in computer science, just to mess around on an alg algorithmic level, something that you can't yeah, do nearly as much at work. At least you can do it for a little while until they realize you haven't actually done any real work in a, in three weeks. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm terrible at math. I actually started a master's in computer science and I quickly was like, I need to make money and this is hard because <laughs> you need to know math. You're not that terrible at math. You realized you weren't going to make money in, in a graduate program. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Addition and subtraction are pretty good. Subtraction I'm even better at. Right. So is there any one piece of technology that you, that you use specifically? Is it R and, and why? What makes that so exciting to use or, 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 or whatever it is? What, what have you done that's really super exciting? Not putting you on the spot here at all. Right. What is it that you say you do here? Uh, well, <laughs> I will say my current role, I'm a, I'm a data scientist. And now I have to use Python all the time there, which I'm... People on the internet already know this. I'm not the biggest fan of Python as a language, but it is essentially the lingua franca of data science and machine learning at this point. I do think that if you're going to hit me up on my biases, R is better than Python for data science, for statistical analysis, because R is a domain-specific language specifically for statistical analysis. And Python is more of a general purpose language that people have shoehorned a whole bunch of stuff into in the data science space. That said, Python is better for deep learning. Um, so you know, a lot of the work in R that's deeper learning related is essentially, I'm going to shell out to Python and let it do the work, which depending on the library, Python is secretly shelling out to C and letting that do the work, which <laughs> is going somewhere else. It's all just a big chain that eventually leads somewhere. But you know, as far as things that I enjoy, I will... I will promote just a little bit uh, the book that I wrote a couple of years ago on an outlier detection. That was something I really enjoyed. Again, kind of gets back into that academic space. My whole goal with that book was specifically, I want to write a book that developers can read and understand that summarizes and shows what's happening in the academic world in what is an interesting space of outlier detection, meaning that I... The research that I did for the book was going through other papers, other books, other resources that are very academic in nature, proceedings from different uh, conferences and series of, of articles that are online or uh, other books in the space for, that are very heavily academic work, textbooks and the like. And then saying, how can I summarize this in a way that your average developer who does not want to go through a statistics course or uh, course on outlier detection would be willing to pick this thing up, read it, and try it out. And that I think is a niche that I've I really enjoy. So taking what is that uh, pie in the sky, ivory tower, academic. We don't have to think about the real world and compute power and and anything like that. And then trying to translate that into something that the professionals, business professionals would be able and willing to learn and use. And that's also where I try to go in a lot of the way that I deliver presentations, the way that I uh, am active at SQL Saturdays and in, in the community. A lot of this, I, I try to take, well, let's grab not only experience, but also a lot of what's happening in that academic world that your average developer doesn't want to dig into too far because it is absolutely a pit of, it's a pit of academic despair. Um, 
it's this you you have all of these papers from all of these individuals at universities written for other people in academia not for average developers trying to you, use academic terminology and uh i think there's a little bit of putting up walls because if i write this thing too simply people won't believe that it's actually a good idea and so there's yes. there's jargon infused in here and what i want to do is take the jargon simplify it make it understandable kind of if anything your your 100 level class that's essentially where i'm trying to sit where it's still it's still a little formal a little academic but i'm trying to introduce people i'm trying to bring you in and say here's here's what's interesting here's what's coming coming around and uh has been noteworthy that's actually how i got into database design and normalization stuff is the very same thing because if you read the textbooks it sounds super boring and super unnecessary i mean you can you can glean a little bit of necessity in there but most of the people just see these diagrams and these ideas and I'm like, eh, I don't care about that. It just makes my day, it makes my database go slower, but there's, there's reasons for it that are buried in all that academia that you then have to read. And I mean, I did terrible when I in college, I got a C in my database class. I don't know how that ended up being the thing, but I, I started working it by accident. There was nobody else who wanted to do it at this company and somebody quit. So I took their place, but yeah, taking the, the big, the big important ideas that are out there and then, boiling them down to the people who just want to get something done is fantastic. And the more you know yeah. why you need to do something, the more you feel like doing it. Yeah. And if if I can, I want to do a little bit of a cross promotion where I will say Lewis's explanation of fourth normal form is probably the best that I've seen in written work. So go grab a copy of the of Lewis's uh, relational. I forget the name of the book. I've got a copy of it in my closet. Uh, one of the older editions, but go grab a copy it's of that. Right yeah, it's on the wall somewhere. I I like to think it's the simplest. <laughs> I don't know if it's the best, but uh, I try for the simplest. That that makes you go, oh yeah, maybe I should think about that <laughs> instead of just like, oh no, if it's third normal form, it's good. No, because no, no. It's worse. Some of those, the some of the things in like first normal form are easy to notice. Everybody feels them. The things that are important when we're from you don't notice and you just argue about later. I draw a very hard line in the sand that voice cod normal form, fifth normal form, those are your normal forms that are S tier. Those are the most important normal forms around. Everything else is commentary. Second and third normal form, get them out of my house. Uh, voice cod is superior, strictly superior to second and third normal forms. I, I, don't even, I don't even, I do not accept that in my household. My wife comes home with a third normal form. I say, no, you come back with voice cod. <laughs> no, I, I find that the Boy Scout normal form makes sense, but it's also really hard to put in simple terms. It, it's not as easy to describe as second and third normal form because they're very obvious problems. And and the things that are not third but are Boy Scout are just they're a little well, bit it's anytime you have, esoteric. you have multiple keys. Oh yeah. Oh no, I'm not I'm yeah. not saying I'm against it. I'm just saying describing right. it and getting people to care about it is it's not as easy as if you can go look, because this is obvious. Right, right. I mean, when I so I do a talk on on normalization and I lead off voice cod normal form with, well, the definition of voice cod normal form is um, all functional de dependencies have super key determinants. It's just six words. What's the problem? And then we spend 10 minutes talking about well, what, what in the world is a functional key? What is a super key? What is a determinant? How does this all fit together? And then how do I actually apply that to an actual database? And that can be a challenge. There, there are good ways to do it. But it takes a while. This isn't a lot of it isn't as trivial as I think we'd we'd like it to be because a lot of normalization does end up as well. It's common sense, and that that's a good idea. That that's a good thing. It should be for the most part common sense. But then you get to the edges and you say, well, I think maybe I could do it this way. I could do it this way. They both technically make sense, but there's a strong reason to do one but not the other. And it's learning where those edges fit and how you can be more rigorous in this application that I think separates the okay database from the well-normalized database. And then there's that time thing that I know a lot of people will think the database is just a detail. And when you do microservices, okay, it is, there is some of that, but you can't, no microservice stands alone, right? You got to put that data in with other systems and those systems are going to be coagulated into things that data scientists work for. 
And they're going to be really sad if nobody's working together and all the databases look different, act different. One's not normalized, one's partially normalized, one's this way. And they're and all they spend their time to do is putting together data and making it work. Right. As opposed to yep. going, you know what? We could make a million dollars more an hour if. Yeah, yeah. Now, cynical me then says, yeah, but ultimately, we're just going to go to the Excel file that the business people are using. <laughs> Yeah, we have all Excel's these 150 fun. microservices. They all combine together into an Excel file. That's probably true. Yeah. It's probably more true than we want to know, right? There's probably a spreadsheet that's holding together the universe. That's a. That's, I, I don't. I, everything I could say, but that sounds political. But I mean, there's probably a spreadsheet, you know, holding together these processes, like airplane, right? There's probably a spreadsheet of airplanes coming into the airport that they're actually marking things down. You're like, well, oh, I, I've, no. I have bad news for us. The uh, the spreadsheet holding together the universe is was created in Lotus Notes. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> Probably so. Okay, so that was that was fun. I thank you. That was some really good insight. Now we're going to move away from the technology here for a second, and let's talk about fun stuff. So I find it fascinating when I find out people do beyond technology. I personally love roller coasters, and I say that probably every show. But roller coasters and theme parks—that's my big thing. I do outside of technology. And I follow many people on Instagram and Twitter. That's right. Twitter, Twitter X, I guess. But, and I love hearing about all the fun stuff people do outside of work. What kind of things do you do when you're not sitting at a desk making the keys dance? That sounded cheesy, but I'm, I'm sticking with it. It works. It works. You know, I, I would like to say that I have all of this extra time where I do all kinds of wonderful things. I, I tend to do a lot of work, but I will say when I'm not doing work, I I uh, am very much into Battletech, which is exactly as old as I am. So it gives you an idea of age. But Battletech, big stonky robots. Um, enjoy it a lot. Enjoy the 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 idea behind it. The whole uh, it's the gaming ethos of it's the future. Big stonky robots. Everything's awful, but not that awful. Not not 40k awful. Just moderately awful. Uh, that I don't know. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a good way to, again, tie in spreadsheet games where any, any type of tabletop game, especially something that FASA created, you get into shadow run, you get into battle tech, uh, crimson skies. If I remember, I think that was FASA as well, but it's all lots and lots of numbers and tables and you roll 400 dice. And then we're going to spend 20 minutes putting together what happened and then do that 12 more times. So, okay. So you're talking that. about board games. You're talking about the yeah, kind tabletop. that have the little pieces and you put them out? So tabletop, yes, yes. Um, we we have a lot of those. I, I've gotten my wife into them. Um, also, video games. So there, there was a Battletech video game. I like that a lot. I get into it every few years. Uh, Mech Warrior, which is more of the first person, get in Stompy Robot and shoot things. Enjoy that a lot as well. Um, actually, Mech Warrior 2 was the first real PC game that I had, and that was my introduction to the the whole Battletech universe, and I uh, greatly enjoyed that. If I go back and look at the graphics today, they were awful, but, you know, when I was that young kid with the brand new Packard Bell computer, no, it, was a, it wasn't <laughs> that, it was a Sony. It was the Sony computer that came after the Packard Bell, um, and it had the MechWarrior 2 CD, uh, you just get in. Wow, this is this is so realistic. It's so lifelike. And then you look twenty years later. And wow, th this was all giant, ugly blocks. That that was uh that's one of the big things that I'm into. Um, also do a fair bit of reading. Uh, a fair amount of is academic, but not entirely academic. I feel like other people have different clocks than I have because I don't seem to have this kind of time. And I watch some TV. I watch you know an hour or two every day, but I that that is still not. That still doesn't make up for it, um, but that's okay. I'm 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 impressed with that because, as we've said, you speak at a lot of Seagull Saturdays. You run the Raleigh Seagull Saturday, the the, the Raleigh Tripass group. You um curated Sequel. What's going on in Raleigh? Is there any chance we'll be um meeting up there as a big large group anytime soon? I hope so. Um, the issue that we have had post COVID has been mostly around finding a venue. We used to have yes, venues true. that we were able to get in the past, and they've all dried up. Uh, we are, again, looking. If we can find a place to host, then we'll probably have something in the spring. I've learned we're in 
we're in ACC country, you don't host anything in September or October because <laughs> someone's going to have a home game between three major universities here, and that's going to draw out a large percentage of your audience. So uh, we also don't do it during March Madness. You, you wait until after March Madness because that's <laughs> even more important in this area. So we have this window. Really, it's around tax day. Basically, uh, you, you pay your taxes, and then you go to SQL Saturday. That's the way we've done it uh, for a, a couple of years. And it's worked out reasonably well. Weather is good, not too hot yet, and uh, tends to be not when universities have major sporting events going on. So we actually get attendance. That was why at the start of the show I mentioned um, college team you you pull for. I actually lived in Winston Salem till I was fifteen, and I was a North Carolina State fan. But we had Wake Forest, Duke, North Carolina, and um, who I'm leaving out? Wake for Wake Forest, North Carolina State, UNC, and Duke, all in the yep. same little area. And it was brutal. Not during football season. I, my first football season, I went to see Wake Forest play North Carolina. I have, I have no memory of that. Really, it was. Football wasn't wasn't like a thing. College football wasn't a thing there. We didn't we never really talked about it when I was a kid. And then I moved to Tennessee, and of course we didn't talk about college basketball until just recently. Right. The year I moved away was the year that they won the national championship, which was such a bummer because I'm in Tennessee, nobody cares, and I wanted to go. I wanted to go like to all the UNC fans. To, ha, 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 finally, we beat. <laughs> didn't happen. And, and you are, so you do a lot of stuff. You do plenty of stuff. You do that's fun and fun to you so that's good. yeah I, I keep busy off the streets out of trouble <laughs> okay so the final question comes from our redgate state of the database landscape survey we do every year we just by the time this goes out we will have wrapped up the 2025 version and this question is non-database developers seem to cha change technologies yearly i go to a few conferences every year where the central topic isn't databases and while there are some topics like JavaScript that never seem to change, database people often get dug into a technology and use it what seems like an eternity. I know I've been doing T-SQL for 20 plus years, almost 30 plus years, let's be fair. So the question is, why do you think database technology seems to iterate so much slower than all the other programming areas? Yeah, I think this is real. And I think that there are a couple of good reasons for it. Uh, I'll start off by saying one of them is uh, database professionals tend to be a lot more conservative than application developers. And I don't mean that in a political sense. I mean that in a uh, in the sense of I don't want things to change nearly as much. It's the same idea. Same, database re same reason. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's, just, it's the same reason why sysadmins tend to be very reluctant to change. It's I have something that is currently working. Please don't break it. Anything new is probably going to break it. Please don't do that to me. Database administrators kind of have to straddle a line a little bit, depending on what your specialization is. If you are truly a production DBA, where your job is to ensure that these databases are up, available, that the data is protected, in that case, you are going to gravitate very heavily toward, let me understand what I have to do, my domain. And to a large extent, I don't want a lot of change. Because change means bugs. Change means things go bad. Change means the thing that was working before is no longer working. And why is it not working? And why can I not get a hold of the people who made it break? And so I think that that is one factor. Now, as you move toward database developers, people who are writing queries, tuning queries, I think you'll see a bit more, I would suppose, flexibility and ideas of how, how much change they're willing to accept, where uh, even then it's still somewhat limited. And I believe that ties into the second reason. Databases live forever. That, uh, that application, you know, we talked, actually you mentioned JavaScript and I was going to joke and say, we have the JavaScript framework of the month club. Every few months, it seems that there is, oh, well today the hot thing is Angular. Oh, Angular is so three months ago, it's React. Oh, what do you mean? It's, it's Express. And you can just start throwing out. I could start throwing out names of fake JavaScript platforms and see if anybody even catches it. Is that is that really a thing? I don't know. You go Google it and see if it is. And we see that happen very frequently where applications change quite rapidly and developers get these harebrained notions of, 
well, now I'm going to, if I just rewrite this application, maybe if I use Rust instead of uh, C Sharp, or I use Go instead of Java, or I, I use Python instead of this language, or Nim instead of Python, because Python so 15 years ago, then this application would be so much better. And I do believe that there is a little bit of that mentality on the development side of the application is... I, I can feel the warts in it. I can see the flaws in it. And, you know, if I just rewrote this thing, then it would be so much better. Whereas databases, there is a lot more uh, management of state. And, well, people care a lot more about the specifics of the data than the specifics of the application. And so that database has been around for 15, 20, 30 years, in some cases, literally. 30, 40 years that they oh, no. may have a That's database great. that originally came from the eighties and just has been pushed forward and forward. I worked with, uh, as a, as a consultant, I did a little bit of work with a company where their database came from Fox pro and they moved it essentially wholesale into SQL server, keeping all of the restrictions that Fox pro had. And that database was, I think it was from the nineties originally, if not earlier. So you, know, you get this this idea of your database has been around and any sort of change to the database requires much more thought. It is harder to isolate changes when you have stateful systems than when you have stateless systems. So in, in result being that uh, this is why I can refactor a method in my object-oriented application here and it takes me one hour, but then you want to add a column to an existing table in a database. Oh, that's three months of work. Now, so we don't get hate mail here. Let's 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 briefly note that we love developers. And as database, as a relational database programmer, without programmers, without somebody to put a user interface on this thing, I got nothing. Boring. Nobody cares. I'm not going to get users to go insert into database. So <laughs> it's great that they make better user interfaces and things like that. It's just like, like you said, I, I completely agree with everything you said. I just want to make sure it's clear we love developers. And it's funny, you kept mentioning frameworks that I have introduction articles on the website about because of that very same thing. Sure, sure. And and in fairness, if if I described what I do on a daily basis, I do a lot more development these days than uh, administration work. They won't let me administer servers anymore. There's this whole separation of duties thing. So. Yes. I haven't really been a true administrator for a, almost a decade. I've done a fair amount of, outside of consulting, consult, even consulting, I'm not really a true administrator. I don't want to be. I, I want to be a, an ar do architecture, do tuning, help people who will be administrators because I don't want to get that call at 3 a.m. Yes, that, that was the worst. That was the reason when, when I was thinking of changing from being in development administration, and being the website editor for Redgate. The one, the number one reason was, I don't want my phone to ever go off in the middle of the night ever again. I don't want to be woken up when my heart and my, my brain were in that complete deep sleep. And all of a sudden it has to like turn back on because that hurts so bad. Oh, absolutely. And then you're supposed to, yeah. you're supposed to go to your freaking desk, turn on your computer and be like ready to not destroy an entire database or something, right? Something you had to fix. And you maybe you had to yeah. delete a row. You don't want to delete all the rows accidentally. <laughs> right, you right, do. exactly. It's That's crazy. It's the worst time to do a major change like that. And yet, we got to get this up right now. Why? Who's on the website? Well, nobody, but, you know, four hours from now, there will be people. Okay, well, couldn't you just come back in four hours when I'm actually awake? Yeah, maybe that million-dollar sale comes through and you're like, we missed it because of you. <laughs> you don't want to be that, that person. And strangely, the people who make the user interfaces aren't the ones that get called first. They get called the next day. That is true. It's absolutely true. I mean, that's the that's the separation there between development and administration goes back to. This is a big part of why I think uh, people who are more on the administrative side tend to say, I don't want radical technology change. And even within that, I don't want to make it sound like every single administrator has this exact same mindset. Every single developer has this exact same mindset. You have obviously uh, gradients within these fields where if you're a developer working on, say, software for automating heart transplants, 
you're probably not going to say, oh, you know what? I'm going to rewrite this thing in a new language and we're just going to ship it into production. No worries. So the relative risk comes into play. And I think that people will graduate towards areas where the relative risk fits their, their internal uh, willingness to accept risk. Yes. What if you're making, you know, antivirus software? Is there any excitement going on there? That's that, I mean, that would, the story with um, CrowdStrike is it still floors me. If you don't know what that is, look it up. Look up CrowdStrike in 2024 if you're watching this someday. Where they, they put some configuration data in, they didn't test it. Lots of things went bad. And there's some somebody there who's like, it was their fault, right? It's somebody, the bug stopped somewhere. And I'm not talking about one manager. I'm talking about the actual worker who did it. And that's got to feel terrible, right? Because I, I know I've messed up things. And it feels terrible just to mess up your own company's database for a couple hours, much less the entire world's on fire. <laughs> and you know it was you. Right. Right. Yeah, that I don't want to be that guy. Now, that guy's never going to do it, do it again. Uh, there's a guarantee, 100%, never going to do that thing again. But, you know, you don't, ideally your mistakes are, are quiet things that you can cover up and pretend never happened. Yes. And right. that you're in a space where you can do that versus, oh, I just covered up something that I accidentally did. And technically the cover up is illegal. Please don't do that. Yes, of course. Not at all. And, and we, we mean covered up. We, we mean like you don't have to talk about it. There's, there's little things you do. Nobody's going to, if you, I don't know, delete a row from a table and application starts breaking, they're not going to point fingers at you, but don't hide it. Yep. Admit it, right? We all make mistakes. To err is very human. <laughs> right, right. Now, to restore the database and get that row back before anybody notices, that is divine. It very much is. <laughs> if you are listening to the audio and not the video, I just put on a list of uh, places where you can find Kevin Fiesel. You can find him at curatedsequel.com. On LinkedIn, he's Kevin Fiesel, F E A S E L 504 7167. Is there a meaning to that number? Or just search for my name. Just search for my name. You'll you'll find me. Just, you might find my dad. You might find another Kevin Fiesel. There, I think there may be other ones. It's but it's sort of like Highlander. There can ultimately be only one. I, I was amazed when I first found out there are other, other Lewis Davidsons out there. I'm like, there were other parents who thought, hey, let's name their kid Lewis Davidson. Hmm. On Twitter or X, if you're not into that whole old thing, it's at F E A S E L K L, and his blog is at. 36chambers.wordpress.com. Now, what is 36 chambers? Does that have a meaning that I should know, or does that have a meaning that you want to share? Of course. Of course. Enter the Shaolin. Actually, in reality, uh, the blog was started. I went to school at the University of Dayton, and our senior year, we lived at 36 Chambers Street. And so we started the blog with the three of us who lived in the house. We started the blog like two or three years after graduation. And I'm now the only one who's still actively on the blog, but yeah, you know, I don't want to change it because it has a long history of existence. I am looking up that. This is the third thing I've had to look up today. First, I looked up lingua franca because I had no idea what that meant. Let's let that one go. Hopefully other people will, will learn these things. I learn a lot like this. People are talking. I'm like, I don't know what that word is. I'll just look it up. 36 chambers. I see it has a Wu-Tang reference. There. There is the Wu-Tang reference. I went with the classic uh, Shaw Brothers movie, 36 Chambers of the Shaolin, which is a fun cool. movie. Was it a fun movie or was it a, are you being sarcastic? I mean, it's, no, it's, it's, it's a fun movie. I have a copy of it downstairs. I actually have uh, the first two volumes of the Shaw Brothers collection. So Hong Kong Kung Fu movies. Um, okay. That is also something I enjoy. Sometimes you say it's a fun movie, like, you know, Saving Private Ryan was a fun movie, but it's not really fun. It's more like a, a good movie, but it's a lot of action, but not good action. So I understand now. Look, we're learning things about music and movies and development and why developers have it easier than database people. Somewhat. Because well, they, they actually do get blamed for things. They, they are the phone on the front lines, admittedly. So there's some of that. I would also like to say, please subscribe, like, tell your friends, all those things to the video, to the audio, lots, listen. You know, just have everybody in your family listen to this. Don't tell them why. They'll love it. And I'm not just talking to Kevin and his family. I mean, 
everybody on earth. Just everybody, share with all your family. families. We go, we go right viral now. and you'll go be share. part of the movement. Thank you, Kevin. All it's right. It's been fantastic. Well, thank you. The $20 I sent Lewis's way certainly paid off. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.